Good morning. Good morning and welcome. We are glad that you're here to worship with us this morning. If you are viewing through the internet or through TV, we are glad you are able to worship with us as well. I have a few announcements to make. First of all, I ask that you put your attendance cards in the offering plate during the offering. And uh, that is all I have for announcements, but I know Dwayne has one. That little thing that you put in the offering plate, uh, on the bottom where it says other, I am looking for someone to make coffee. If I, if I can make coffee, Jerome can make coffee, there's people that can make coffee. Um, we wa I want to do a rotation for first service. So not only one person is going to be doing coffee and making coffee for the early service. If you can help uh, with making coffee, We'll be grateful. Um, if you can do it, just put, put it on there and I'll um, get in contact with you about um, making coffee and the rotation. Thank you. Thank you, And Dwayne. God bless. And I think you ought to maybe add some donuts in on part of that deal, too. Oh, yeah. That sounds good. It, yeah. yeah. It'd be great. Any other announcements this morning? I ask you to stand with me and join in this morning's prayer in unison. Welcoming God, when Moses met you at the burning bush, you told him it was holy ground. Do we come to you with the same awe and reverence? As we begin this day together with you, may we be transformed because we have been in your presence. Thank you for meeting us here in your holy name. Amen. Let's continue standing as we sing hymn number 77. Thank you.
Let's take a moment to greet those among us. and peace to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. We're glad you're here. I've got some uh, things that I'm just passing out from uh, Decision America Tour 2016. Franklin Graham's going to be in Harrisburg on Thursday, uh, the, the 15th of the month, and uh, bringing his tour in which they're, they're praying through all the 50 states. And so I've just got these to pass out. And, and uh, yeah, if you just send them back that way and send them back that way. But uh, that's going to be from noon to one on Thursday. Uh, I am not going to Harrisburg, and I don't know if anyone going at the moment, but I want you to know about it. Uh, and if you'd like to be joining during that hour or before or after. But uh, the prayer course is that, that we would uh, pray um, and uh, vote and, and engage. And we're just asking God to work in, in our nation. Okay? I'll address this just a little bit later in, in the message today as well. So if my arithmetic is right, it's 15 years since 911, right? Uh, I heard Jerome saying a little bit earlier this morning that almost everyone knows where you were that day. And uh, I was driving my cousin, who's a, a missionary down to Meadville to, to meet some people in Meadville. And I remember when we got out of the car, uh, the people where we were going asked us to come in, come in quietly. And, uh, and we were there shortly after 9 o'clock uh, or 9, 10 or whatever that was, um, witnessing that and not knowing what was going on. You remember the anxiety that took place? You remember all that? Well, that's a reminder to us of those first responders as well. Yes, it was unbelievable loss of life and, and horrible for our nation, horrible for the people of New York. But, uh, but it's just a reminder to us to pray for those who, who are called upon very first to meet us at times of disaster and uh, for the police officers, the fire department, uh, emergency workers of every kind, the ambulances, the, the medics. I um, thought maybe we would be lifting them up today because they are the ones who care for us in all these situations. It's only been a few weeks since, the, um, since on the campus of uh, uh, Pinotitisville where they had done the, the, uh, the, what, you know, the mock shooting event that had taken place. And I watched that with great interest from afar, I didn't want to get close there that day, but I watched that with great interest on that as we try to prepare, uh, never knowing what might happen in this world. Now, we're not saying that God's not in charge, God still is in charge, by the way, but, but evil things do happen and tremendous bad happens. So uh, let's lift up some of those people who will be those first responders. Let's go to prayer. So, oh, one other thing, by the way. I, I, this is also Grandparents Day. Everyone like me as a grandparent, raise your hand. All of you who aren't grandparents should applaud right now. Yeah, 
I'm an awesome one too. I'm telling you, my youngest grandson just turned one yesterday. He's the one that's visually impaired, okay? He's the one that cannot see very well. And uh, we've recently seen a video, ask me to see it sometime, but he's got an app now where we weren't sure if he could see anything. He's got an app on a, on a tablet where he follows with his eyes right up to it. He can see something moving across the screen and you can see him following it and going down. He's looking out peripherally somehow. I don't know how he does it, but there's something there. So at his first birthday, uh, we, we FaceTimed it and, uh, and I got a chance to see him and, and he was burying his face in the cake. He knows what a cake feels like on the face right about, okay? So, uh, and, I, and I, you know, and, and there's really no time for you to talk about your grandchildren, only me to talk about mine. <laughs> I'm just teasing you. You understand what a blessing it is for that. And uh, for all of you who uh, are caring for, the, for your grandchildren in any shape or form, do it and do it well. Hold them up in prayer. Show them what it's like for godly men and women to love their families. Uh, I thought that while I was watching KFC just this last week, how many people were grandparents. And this is my philosophy. I've got grandchildren out in Kansas, grandchildren down in, in uh, Virginia, and I want to help look after your grandchildren here at this place because I'm praying that God raises up men and women like you, just like you, out in those other places to look after my grandchildren. Does that sound like a plan of attack? So never get tired and think that you're done looking after the young ones in our congregation. Let's go to prayer. Almighty God, we worship you. We have our own agenda when we come in there. We know that. But it begins to melt away as we sense being in your presence. Thank you, Lord, that you have watched over us in dark times, such as what the nation went through on September, um, September 11th, uh, 15 years ago. There are families that are affected by that and wounded by that to this day. But we remember, Lord, not, not for revenge even, but we remember also the, the incredible accounts of, of, um, of the heroes, those who lost their lives and those who cared for it so that more did not lose their lives. So we lift up the first responders today. Uh, first of all, give you thanks for the ones who who, uh, even though they'd given up their life, had shown us what uh, un unconditional sacrifice is. But we also pray, Lord, for those in our community who are first responders, the fire department, to the police department, um, to the medics, to those, Lord, who just make, uh, make a difference every time that we're in a difficult situation. Lord, you've done so much in order to care for us and protect us. And we simply pray that you would watch over those first responders, uh, giving them every opportunity to become the men and women you've called them to be from the foundation of the world. We also celebrate with grandparents this day, uh, a day in which uh, much of the nation is, is remembering grandparents and, and, uh, and thanking them. And I cannot help but, but, uh, real, cannot help but just remember the tremendous ones that you have given me. And if that's true in my case, then I'll bet that's true right across this room and in this sanctuary. Great cloud of witnesses, so many of them in our, some of our lives are gone now. Great cloud of witnesses are already in heaven. And, and I know that they have rooted for us to remain faithful to you. We can uh, see the writer of Hebrews painting a beautiful picture of that cloud of witnesses. We pray for each one here though, Lord, who, who has been blessed to see their own grandchildren knowing, Lord, that the miracle of birth is just something that, that continues to give and give and give. And so we're asking that you would enable us, who are grandparents, to walk faithfully before you, humbly before you. Uh, and we pray for our grandchildren, that they would have every opportunity to respond to you. And so for them to respond to you, Lord, we cannot just sit back and say, I'm done serving in Jesus' name. If anything, Lord, we throw our hat back into the ring and we will serve wherever you call us to serve. For this worship service and all that you want to do in our midst, uh, we give you thanks. For the miracle of our friend Dottie and the healing that she has been experiencing during this last week. We are speechless and we just simply raise our hands in thanksgiving to you for what you've done in her life and allowing us to witness it as well. And as we worship, Lord, 
Let us worship you as one who is in this place, not as one that we have just heard about. Be present with us, O Lord, we pray, in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We invite the children to come forward at this time for this morning's children's moment. And we get to have it with the puppets this morning and the puppet team. So rather than come up on the steps, let's sit right here in this seat right up front on this side. Everybody, I'd like to tell you a story. Hey, Annie. What do you want, Robbie? Special treatment. Special treatment? Do you have a disease? No, but since I'm the star of the show, I deserve to be treated like a star. Now, wait a minute. Jesus was pretty special, right? Sure, he's the most important person in history. Well, I'd like to tell you about something he did. He walked on the water. No. He fed 5,000 people. Well, he did do those things, but that's not what I wanted to tell you about. Well, it must have been something really spectacular because he's more famous than I am. <laughs> Jesus and his disciples were getting ready to eat. Waiter, menu please. Jesus got up from the table and took off his coat. And he put on his special dinner jacket. No, he grabbed a towel. Hmm, I guess he's going swimming. Nope. He wrapped the towel around himself. Never mind, he's going to be a sumo wrestler. No! He took a wash basin and filled it up with water. Then he put his rubber ducky in it. Not really. Jesus began to wash his disciples' feet. He what? I never do that. I'd get the servant to do it. Well, that's what they usually did. This was considered a job for only the lowest servant. Because feet are pretty low. So Jesus did this to all his disciples, but when he came to Peter... The pumpkin eater? Who? You know, Peter, Peter, pumpkin eater. No, this was Simon Peter, the disciple. Peter said, you shall never wash my feet. Because I'm ticklish. No, you see, Peter thought that Jesus shouldn't be doing such a disgusting job. But <clears throat> Jesus said, if I don't wash your feet, then you won't have any part of me. Now when Peter heard this... He got up and packed his bags. He loved Jesus. So he made him a valentine. No. Peter wanted to be with Jesus always. So he said, then wash my hands and head too. Don't forget behind the ears. But Jesus said the feet will be enough and he washed them. This little piggy went to the market. When Jesus was finished, he asked Peter, do you know what I've done? Yep, he washed Peter's feet. Jesus said, you call me your teacher and your master. And you call me your puppet. He's talking to Peter. Oh, sorry. He said, if I, your teacher, and your master, wash your feet... Then they must be really dirty. Jesus said, if I wash your feet, then you shall wash each other's feet. Should they take their shoes off first? Jesus was teaching an important lesson here. Do you know what we should learn from this? Don't tell me. I'm on my way. Robbie, where are you going? To get the stuff to wash your feet. You don't need to do that. I think I do. I can smell them from here. Hey! No, seriously, I can smell them. Jesus was trying to teach us that no matter who we are, we're supposed to serve, help, and love each other. Because even Jesus came to serve, not to have others serve him.
I'm going to put Skip Baldwin on the spot here. He's one of our puppet leaders. I'm going to come ask him if he'll come up and pray over uh, you, you children before we have our children's collection. Skip, would you do that for us? Good morning. It's good to be here. Good to see all these kids. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you, Lord, for another opportunity to minister to the children, Lord, and to everyone else. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll be with each and every one of these children, Lord. We just pray, Lord, that you'll help us to be, Lord, the examples that us adults need to be for them so they know how to live their, live their lives, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, that you'll touch their hearts. Touch their bodies, help them grow up healthy, Lord. Help them grow up, Lord, spiritually healthy for you, Lord. Just be with them. In your name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, it's time for our children's collection. If you want to come over and grab a basket. This one has a pen. At this time, we invite the ushers to come forward for the receiving of this morning's tithes and offerings. In the early 1900s, a lady by the name of C.D. Uh, Martin, or Mrs. C.D. Martin, uh, had been bedridden for about 20 years. And uh, she and her husband went to visit another couple who were both invalids and could not get out of bed. And uh, they really were so much impressed with it. And Mrs. Martin's husband said to them, what do you attribute your, your well-being, your good spirit with all this? And the lady said, his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches me. And she went back from there, uh, Mrs. Martin went back to there in about an hour, had pretty much put together the song that you and I've heard so many times, his eye is on the sparrow.
provider. And God, we thank you for providing for us, whether it's financially, physically, spiritually, emotionally. God, we thank you. God, we're able to give back. And not out of just what's left over, God, but from what comes first. Because we understand that your kingdom is the most important thing that we can be a part of. God, we ask that you would use this offering to further your kingdom, to spread your good news, the best message you ever heard. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue to stand as we sing hymn number 369. significance to the all right I've got a new friend up here I keep looking to make sure there's not a watch in there a clock or some kind of hint going on there or when that will be I'll just send my friend over here
The scripture reading today is taken from the book of Psalm, or Psalm 14. This uh, psalm is repeated almost word for word in Psalm 53 as well. Psalm 14. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, their deeds are vile, there is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. All have turned aside, they have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Will evil doers never learn those who devour my people as, as men eat bread and, and who do not call on the Lord? There they are, overwhelmed with dread. For God is present in the company of the righteous. You evildoers, frustrate the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be. This is the word of God for the people of God. preacher, you work out of Psalm 14, you also need to remember D.L. Moody. You remember Moody, and you've probably heard this as well as I have, but Moody was a businessman, evangelist, educator, publisher, a preacher extraordinaire, by the way, uh, responsible for the Moody Bible Institute. It was un not unusual for him, and he started, by the way, leading people to praying with people in the Civil War right up through 1899. Moody would uh, do the services and many times hecklers would uh, come there in order to frustrate him because he was so bold and he was so, you could say dogmatic about offering Jesus uh, and, uh, and made no apology for it, nor should he. But there were atheists who would follow him around. And one particular atheist did just that. So Moody is going up into the pulpit and Usher hands him a, an envelope, a note. He opens up the note and the only thing on the sheet of paper is the word full. And he could see down there, pretty sure the, the atheist that, that probably had followed him to this particular service again. And uh, so Moody, uh, who was always very quick of wit, said, you know, I have seen many times when someone will write a letter and they forget to sign their name at the end. This is the first time I've ever seen anyone sign their name but fail to write the letter first. <laughs> Moody actually changed what he was preaching, they tell me, that day and dealt more with uh, knowing that, that God is God and, uh, and how foolish it is to reject him in the first place. The verse, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. For that reason, for that reason I'm just lifting up the, the, Billy, or the, the Franklin Graham Decision American Tour, the prayer rally, just keeping it before you. And again, that happens on Thursday, September 15th, and, uh, and going around the states, and we're turned to be at our capital on Thursday, and uh, we want to be in, in prayer for them, and for their safety, and for our nation and for our state, okay? Furthermore, not only that, uh, in talking with uh, Margie Baker, Margie put into my hands the, the Prayer 31, a Pray 31 guide. Some of you may have seen this, I, I used this uh, a decade ago in some place, but uh, which is a pretty good idea. Margie said to me, have you noticed, Larry, that everyone is moaning and groaning about uh, And I have noticed that. Uh, everyone's moaning and groaning and really unhappy. I like to say whining and, and weeping and wailing almost is going on, okay? And she, she said, and what would it be like if we were to quit doing that and the church to just begin to pray for our nation and pray for the things that are going on? And uh, Margie's right on target. You know she's right, by the way. Absolutely correct. So she put into my hands, pray 31. Beginning on the 1st of October, we're going to use this prayer atlas, is what it is, which will take us through all 50 states. So you do your arithmetic. But those states are all there. And we'll be going through that and praying for them. And um, I think that you'll find this well worth your while. It'll start on Saturday, October the 1st. We'll hand these out to you 
uh, in two weeks from today, but I want you to be praying for it. This is called the prayer meeting to lead up to the prayer meeting, all right? Uh, but uh, we're not trying to do anything more than unite the congregation in seeking God for our nation. As simple as that. Keep that before you. Have you ever noticed that uh, on your money it says, in God we trust? But that probably is not true. It probably could say, in God some of us trust, right? In January of 2016 of this year, uh, the gentleman who is, uh, he's a lawyer in Sacramento, uh, and um, I believe his name is Michael Newdow, had, um, had filed a lawsuit wanting to remove In God We Trust. And, and you, know how, you know how crazy that gets whenever we start dealing with that as a nation. It's just those who want it and those who don't want it. And, and um, so he, he's, he's wanting to remove that from the nation. He's the same one who did the lawsuit a few years ago about removing the one nation under God from the Pledge of Allegiance. And he lost that particular battle when it got to the Supreme Court. Uh, they're doing that. And I only say it to say this. Um, it seems like uh, the, the American atheists are, are, are pushing noise in the public arena. And I think that the legitimate question today is, what should Christians do about it, if anything? Or can Christians do anything about it? And let me just give you a hint at how this ends. The things that you and I can usually do about it is faithfulness on our own part, okay? As opposed to trying to change everyone around us all the time, for you and me to be able to before God is the way to go. Am I going in and out? My voice going in and out? Well, may God... I can, you let me know if there's another mic I should grab, folks, okay? Having said that, let's go back at this passage of Scripture. And uh, I, want you to, I want you to see it here. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. Now, I'm not a Hebrew scholar. There probably are those here who have much better Hebrew background than I do. But I am at least able to know that the word uh, for fool uh, comes from the Naval, which, uh, which if you have a study Bible, NIV, it talks about being morally, morally empty. But if you uh, uh, listen to the root meeting, it's, a, it's an empty vessel or a hollow instrument. An empty vessel or a hollow instrument so, so you get this concept of, of how, uh, how frustrating that, that this can be. Empty vessel, meaning, meaning uh, not so much that they lack intelligence, but they lack awareness and knowledge of God. And because they lack awareness and knowledge of God, the behavior is going to be less than what God demands and is asking of us in the first place, okay? So... If you can just uh, picture <coughs> some of the people you know who do not believe in God or believe that God does not exist, then you can begin to, to grasp what it's like. Sometimes their behavior is a little bit different. They won't be as worried about their neighbors, usually. They won't be as concerned about how other people fare. A lot of things will just be important to them and them as individuals. So, uh, uh, which brings us now to this challenge that I believe we have from the atheist. I'm calling this today the atheist challenge. You know, uh, the biggest challenge is probably not the political activists, the ones that are trying to do that, even though, even though that's frustrating and I get weary of it, I would just soon it all be left alone. I don't think that's the biggest challenge. I, I think the biggest challenge comes from the intellectual atheists who are, are ridiculing you and me as having no brains, by the way. How about the person sitting beside you? Is there any intelligence in that one sitting beside you? You know, when you look in their ears, does it go all the way through somehow or something like that? 
Do you, like me, find it insulting that someone like Dawkins thinks that religion is a crutch in my life? And I'm not going to take on Dawkins, because if we were in a debate, I would get beaten up so badly, it would be pathetic. But my faith would not change. Dawkins wrote the book, uh, 2006, the, the God Delusion. Christopher Hitchens wrote 2009, God is not great. I still see that book out on the shelves, certain places where I go. Uh, and and that's, that's the challenge because the ridicule that comes from, from those who, who believe there is no God in some shape or form makes it difficult for you and for me. Now, to be sure, when this psalm was written, this psalm would have been crafted for the people of Israel. Uh, but they would have been referring to all that were surrounding them and even some of the people of Israel who were vessels of God, big vessels of God himself, but were no longer living as if they were. So hence he saw them as fools or empty vessels, not behaving the way they were designed to behave and the function for which they were designed to serve. When I was 19 years old, I was attending summer school. Now, you can interpret from that that I was a lousy student. That's the reason I was attending summer school that year. But I thought, I'm going to take something that I want to get into. I think I'll take a world religions course. Now, taking a world religions course in a state university can be very interesting, all right? Uh, so I did. I took that, and, and, uh, uh, and I was pretty excited to be there. The very first day, and by the way, uh, I thought the faculty member, this would be good, because he was in the same church where I was attending at that time, and I thought, oh, this this will be good. And uh, as soon as I got in there, I could tell that he was going to go the world religions route and make sure that we were being very tolerant of, of other faiths and, and, uh, and, and that you were going to move us to understand that there's more than one way to God. That was the direction that they were going. And so he, uh, he started it out by saying, how, how many of you in this class believe in God? I raised my hand. I love Jesus. I was discipling and I was happy to confess him as Lord and Savior. So I believe in God. How many of you uh, believe that, that uh, uh, Jesus is the only way? Uh, well, I left my hand up, but a whole lot of hands went down around that class. Maybe 18 of us in that class. How many of you think that the Bible is an accurate word of God? More hands begin to drop. But this time he's starting to chuckle. And he says, well, how many think that Adam and Eve were real people? More hands went down. But this time my hands feel awful heavy and I'm really feeling stuck out in the crowd. One other guy was with me. Two more questions come. How many of you think that Moses really crossed the Red Sea on dry ground? <laughs> By the time, there was just two of us. And it was just, you could see where this was going. And, uh, and, and, but, but you felt like if you let your hand down, you might as well give up everything you've ever believed about God in the first place. And so on it went. And I began at that time to become good friends with the other guy who kept his hand up, by the way, because we needed each other. And, uh, and I also had the opportunity to just look at Paul's writings and, and knowing that he probably was one of the most intelligent men to ever walk the face of the earth. And how he began to understand that the great wisdom of the wise was many times made foolish by God in his presence. And I worked pretty hard in trying to understand that and stay with that during that time. Here's the, the psalmist's answer on, on how he feels about, the, uh, how he feels about, about those who, who are unfaithful. I don't have it before you, but I'll just read it to you again. I'm, if you're following along at, in, in the pew, it's in uh, Psalm 14 too. The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand, any who seek God. By the way, it's one thing to come to church, it is another thing to seek God. Do you understand the difference on that? All right. All have turned aside, they have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Will evildoers never learn those who devour my people as men eat bread and, and who do not call on the Lord? Um, in other words, the evildoers many times pick on God's people in such a way that it's, it's devastating. Then he goes on, five says, there they are overwhelmed with dread for God is present in the company of the righteous. Did you ever see someone really uncomfortable uh, with everybody else? There was a time in my life in which, uh, in which uh, I had taken a, a strong uh, political st stance uh, against abortion. I'm not trying to, to be on that. I'm not, not pushing anyone for that right at the moment, but I, I took a strong stance. 
And I remember being down in Pittsburgh standing in, uh, in front of uh, one particular place that was offering that, but it was, it was a prayer time. And uh, literally, we were praying at that point. I had, uh, I had probably been more demonstrative before, but this time we were just praying and holding hands and praying. And, uh, and I can remember there was a group in Pittsburgh at that time calling themselves the Church Ladies, which was after Saturday Night Live uh, Church Ladies, okay? And so they would come down the street and they would shake their fingers at us and, and they were having fun and it was one of those kind of things. I remember one of the men who was dressed up like a church lady got out of that, that group and came over to where, where we were and, and broke my hand from the other person and held hands with me. And, and I can remember praying in the middle of that, uh, that thing, uh, and, and I don't do this very often, folks, but I can remember praying say, saying, uh, uh, Satan, you have no room in this circle. And I remember that guy throwing our hands down so fast because evildoers are not present in the company of the righteous, says that. You and I have to work really hard to be able to, to not appear judgmental to, to the unrighteous, to those who, who really believe that God does not exist in many ways. And I saw him throw that hand down. He literally jumped out of there like he'd been hit with electricity. I don't experience this all the time, by the way. I, I've just told you my most dramatic story, probably, of prayer, okay? But, but he, he jumped out of that circle and, and, ran, and ran away, all laughing with his buddies, high-fiving as they went on down the street. And I began to see what the psalmist is talking about, how, how there's just this strong desire for the, for the fool who does not think that God exists, or he behaves or she behaves as if God does not exist. I am not the right one to deal with some scientific issues. I have worked on the battle between Darwinism and creation science. I have worked on that. I understand the struggle. I can see why so much of, of those with Darwin philosophy, why they, they think that, that, that intelligent design is, is useless. But I also have been around those who are working in intelligent design and, and discovering and seeing things that the that, um, rest of the scientific community doesn't want to look at it because it doesn't even fit their worldview many times. But I'm not here to even debate any of that right at the moment. I'm here to talk about the possibility that there might be an atheist in the pews, in the churches in which you and I worship. I really appreciate the fact that, that they aren't the ones who stand up in the middle of the sermon and try to take you on. That would be a different experience, wouldn't it? That would be, that would be tough. I appreciate that they're polite. But by atheist in the pew, we simply mean someone who has the form of religion, someone who is here, and yet really lives the rest of their life as if God does not exist. So if you see them as a vessel or an instrument designed by God to serve him, what they are really is an empty vessel. And that empty vessel is not an IQ thing, it's not intelligence. That empty vessel is more part of, of a waste of the knowledge of God. A dearth of being able to understand how God works. I've been around this congregation enough to see some wisdom coming from some of you that really I need to be around and I want to be around as often as I can. Uh, some of the wisdom, that, when I'm around some of you who, who not only do you know God, but that you've known him so well that it helps you to rightly live and to somehow care for other people in a way with the wisdom that can only come from God. Just like you're living right out of the book of Proverbs in some ways with, uh, with Jesus at, the, at your heart and soul of your, of your life. And that's the, the, the reason why uh, we just acknowledge that there might be uh, some, right even within the hearing of my voice, that are struggling with doubt in some shape or form as to whether or not God really exists. And I want you to look at me if you can, if you will. I am not here to judge you this day. I am not here to give you a hard time. I'm not here to ridicule you at all. I'm here to remind you that many of the people serving in this place began their faith journey with incredible doubts. Some of those doubts were spiritual doubts. Some of those doubts were, were intellectual. Some of you, you doubted whether or not the scripture was really God's word. 
and, uh, and, and all those things would come on. But bit by bit, some of those questions have been answered. But even if those questions have not been answered, many in this place understand that God's knowledge is two different ways. There is a scientific, um, just nuts and bolts understanding of, of, uh, of our bodies and our lives, but there is also a heartfelt thing. The fool says in his heart, the seed of passion. It's really a belief issue, not an intellectual issue many times. And says in his heart that there is no God. And that's the one who is an empty vessel. Because of that, they cannot become what God has planned them to be. I've shared with you already how dangerous it is. Maybe if you've been sitting in the pew for year after year, decade after decade, studies show that, that it's less and less likely that, you're, that you will allow your heart to be softened by the spirit that blows through this place into our lives and through the lives of one another um, and, and how scary that is. Let me pick up the, the, the last uh, verse, actually verse 7, halfway down this slide. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. When the Lord restores his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. This was written a long time before Jesus came. And you and I are living a long time after Jesus has already come. You and I have the benefit of the outpouring of God's Spirit. Some of the things that we cannot understand scientifically, quite frankly, there are sometimes uh, things I wrestle with in Scripture that I can't quite grasp yet. But, but, my, but the doubts that I, that I struggle with, with whether it be uh, uh, intellectual or spiritual, those things are, are cared for by the, by the grace of God. I have seen so many other evidences of his reality. You've, uh, you've heard us uh, celebrating some of the good things happening in, in Dottie's life right at the moment up in the hospital after that seemingly devastating stroke. We've, I'm seeing things that, I'm seeing some things that, that I have not seen in so much of my life. And, and I, all I can say again and again is thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So the question comes, so now what? What if the fools of Psalm 14 may even be among us in the pews? Then you and I need to have the very spirit of Christ as we relate to one another. When you and I behave poorly, not that you ever do, let's just use Larry, okay? Whenever I behave poorly, I just think people drop off with the faith by the droves. If I behave like God does not exist, then how do I expect the person with honest doubts to be able to function in some shape or form? And you multiply my behavior times the behavior of a congregation, just look at me, does God exist or not? If he does, and if you have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus, then it's going to make a difference in how you treat someone else from now on. Can I get an amen? You know, the more you say amen, the quicker we get done. Do you know that? Sometimes it encourages me to go further, but I, not today. Finally, will you and I commit, recommit our lives to Jesus and not live as though God is not here? Our conversations, the way we care for one another, can we do it that way? In just a moment, we're going to be singing a song. And uh, it's just as I am. I was rereading Billy Graham just this morning, rereading a piece that he had written about that. Of course, they use that in the services so often for people to come forward and receive Christ. And, and for some people, he's a great hero, and other people, they just soon push it away. But, but Graham said one of the reasons that they used that song over and over and over again, and it was written by another lady who had been an invalid for a long time, and she'd get so spiritually discouraged about her faith that, that she would have to... Uh, uh, that she would have to remind herself of all the reasons to believe. I believe we're only going to sing three verses of that today. Um, and, uh, but I want you to hear those words as we sing together and just hear God calling you and me to recommitment to our lives, to him. We stand as we sing that together. Just one, two, and five.
it be possible to put the words of that last verse up again? That's why it's exciting to do ministry with me. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. We're going to number five. We're going to just read this here with me. In fact, read it with me, will you? Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relief. Because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come. I come. I come. Truth of this, the truth of this uh, is, is beautiful. Uh, no matter what you might have been experiencing, if you're struggling with doubt, if you're struggling with intellectual issues, if you're struggling with behavior, if you're struggling with lifestyle, whatever that may be in your life, the, the, the promise is he takes you and me just the way we are right now. Will you pray with me? Lord says you will cleanse and pardon. I give you thanks as you move through this place doing just that. Lord, when we sense your presence in this place, let us behave with wisdom and fill us as the vessels that we're designed to be to be your servants. In Christ's name, go in peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.